It's time for my yearly tradition. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. That's right, every December, I seem to get a Les Paul artisan. I don't plan it to be that way, but for the past five to six years of my life, I always happen to buy one during this time. And it's just funny because I associate these guitars with Christmas because in the music video for Father Christmas, Dave Davies there is playing a Les Paul artisan. So it's just funny how that always works out. Last year, we documented this really cool blue artisan that's still in my personal collection. This year, I found an interesting one live while guitar guitar hunting. It was kind of funny finding this live when I was recording because at first I didn't purchase it and I told you everything that made this thing special. However, when my editor finished the video or the day that I knew that it was going to be there, I looked at it again and I decided, ah, I, I need to seal the deal on that because this ended up being so special. I talked myself into it. So it's one of these very, very oh man, this is just gorgeous. I love it. It's not like active flame top or anything, but it's got a lot of nice wood grain here. It hasn't faded like sometimes these really dark ones do. And it's not so dark that you can't actually tell it's a walnut color. That happens sometimes. But this is a Les Paul Artisan, in case you haven't seen one before. It's known as the Hearts and Flowers model. It has really fancy inlays. They're pretty gaudy for what they are, but let's go ahead and fill you in with the whole history here. The Les Paul Artisan was a super ultra fancy high-end model, the second highest end Les Paul that was ever produced in the Norlin era, at the time of its introduction anyways. Second only to THE Les Paul, which you can check out videos on here. So these were around from roughly 1975 until 1982. I mean, the first official year is 76, but according to shipping ledgers, two of them did ship in 75. So in order to tell you have a first year example, you're either going to have a serial number that starts with the letter C, which I've documented here, or it's going to be a decal serial number that says limited edition 00, then blah, blah, blah. But they came in a walnut finish, a sunburst finish, and an ebony finish. Now the walnuts, there's actually like three different hues that you will find. There's one that's so dark, it's almost black, but then those can fade over time to look way different. But then there's also just like light smoky walnut colored ones, which are my absolute favorite. And then just like a, you know, a general walnut walnut out there. And then in 1982, there is a very rare run of approximately 10 white Les Paul Artisans with black binding. That's one of my bucket list guitars. I gotta find me one of those. So it's not my white Les Paul artisan that I'm searching for yet, but this was still a custom order. How did I know that? So within the Les Paul Artisan's production, three pickups were standard until around 1979 when they flipped it to two pickups as standard, and then custom orders can be three. You can find two pickup custom orders within the three, or custom order three pickups within the two pickup era, which this one definitely is because it's a three pickup done up in the year 1982. Now the other kind of cool thing for the Les Paul Artisan is they were the very first model to feature these flip out winding tuners. So in that hunting episode, when I first saw this, I thought this was a 1978 and it just happened to have those features. And that's why it was a three pickup model. But then I noticed the bridge, that's an 80s part. That's known as the three point adjust -a -matic bridge. And then I saw the diamond posi lock strap buttons and it just made me so excited. This was definitely a last year Les Paul Artisan that has all the cool 80s specs. All we're really missing here are the Tim Shaw PAF stickers on here. But you gotta remember, most Artisans actually came with tar back pickups. So I'm excited to tear this thing apart to see, did it actually get Tim Shaw PAFs or does it have the regular pickups of the era? However, the other thing that makes this one special is the fact that, hey, we still have a maple neck. 82 is kind of a transition year back into mahogany, but you're going to notice this is an artisan that does not have a volute stock from the factory. Again, 82 is a transition year, so it just happened to be made late enough in production that it didn't get the volute. But here we go, two beautiful Les Paul Artisans, how most people think of them, either two pickup or three pickup variation with the different walnut colors here. You can kind of see what I was talking about earlier. I had the, the smoky ones, even though this one hasn't aged too much, and the slightly darker one without fading. So this one shipped to me in a Gen 2 chainsaw case, AKA the absolute best case Gibson has ever made. In my opinion, they kind of reissued the wrong ones, but I'm sure these are more expensive to make. If you need help learning the difference between the generations, check out this episode right here. But inside our case compartment here, unfortunately just empty strings and end of fender pick. No cool case candy. But first impressions here, oh my goodness, this thing is a boat anchor. It will not surprise me if it's 12 pounds. 
But that's okay, that's just to be expected. They are usually pretty heavy guitars. But it looks like all our inlays are intact. This thing is in pretty good shape. I wouldn't call it minty. We actually do have some marks on the back, but since this is such a cool late special order 1982, I will be adding this one to my personal collection as long as it all checks out on the workbench. So that's our next step here. Let's throw it on up there to take a look at its parts and specs. The process of cleaning a guitar is so labor intensive and it really hurts your hand, but I'm just addicted to the results of it. I mean, this thing came back to life. And I found something that I didn't realize was special about this one. It has a two-piece maple top. So in the Norland era, everything was three pieces or more for the most part. Occasionally, you will find a rare center seam. Or if you're really lucky, like in this episode, you'll have a one-piece maple top, but that's generally a super special example. Finding a two-piece is definitely special. So outside of the whole three pickup thing and everything else we just learned that's another feature that makes this one incredibly special but let's go ahead the moment of truth what kind of pickups do we have in here well it's the regular tarbacks so these guys get their name because they were epoxy coated so unfortunately when these go bad you really can't rewind them because getting the covers off is nearly impossible like i heard there's one guy in germany or something that can do it but your average tech won't be able to help you and it is common for these pickups to die. So we'll have to make sure these are working, but I love these pickup cavities. They're so clean and you have a very interesting color combination here because you can see the solid mahogany body. Well, actually it's 82. It is possible this has weight relief, whereas all the other ones will not because 82 is around when they started that, when they started transitioning the neck and like getting rid of the volute. So maybe, just maybe, because just because your guitar weighs 13 pounds doesn't mean it doesn't have nine holes in it still. But I love that cross section it reminds me of like a fancy brownie you got the dark finish on the top then you get your maple and then the mahogany it's just a cool scene but as far as our readings within the circuit the bridge is 15.59k ohms that's pretty hot the neck 15.77 and then our middle uh oh that's very low do we have a dead pickup no it's just how Gibson does their wiring for three pickups. So the middle position, when it's wired traditionally for Gibson, instead of being these two, when you have the third humbucker, they wire these two together in kind of an out-of-phase tone. It's not exactly out-of-phase, but basically it gives you a Stratocaster-like tone. So if you only like humbuckers, you don't want a single coil Stratocaster or Telecaster in your collection, get yourself a three humbucker Les Paul. Or get one that has a coil splitting option, but this can be a lot more fun. So this is known as the three point top adjust bridge. Top adjust because instead of having your saddles here and you adjust them on the side, you adjust it from the top. Whether that's more convenient or not, I'll leave that up to you. But the most unique feature about these guys is the fact that they have three places that they can mount to the post. So most bridges have just a standard slight slant, but this one can be straight up, straight in the middle, straight down, or you can have any combination in between. Middle, middle, lower, lower, upper, middle, this way, that way, <laughs> any way you want it to go. Most people generally just set them up like this, but that's great because if you run out of intonation room, instead of having to rip the studs out, re-drill it, put it where it needs to go, you can just tilt your bridge. You're good to go. This was a very shortly lived part in Gibson history. And then we've got the TP6 tailpiece here. In case you don't know how these things work, you've got these little flappers and the ball end of the string connects to them right there. And then your fine tuner here pokes the flappers up and down. You can see the end of the screw right there. So by slightly moving that, it changes the pitch of the string. These were a Rendell wall creation. And BB King liked to use them because they were so easy to string up. You don't have to pull it through a tailpiece. You just lock that in, then you tie your string on and you're ready to go. But these were initially designed for as you're playing like a chord, if you're holding one for jazz, and you need to take your picking hand and fine-tune one of the strings because you're like, ah, that's not quite right. That's why it was here. Personally, I've never really been a big fan of these. They change the way the guitar feels in a negative aspect, in my opinion, but there's some guys that like them. I just like them because they're fancy. Then it looks like this one actually has a sustain sister around it. What those are are giant brass blocks that replace the normal tiny studs. You can always tell if you have them because they're a little bit wider and have more of a profile. But if you actually take those out, they're like just a big brass block. I mean, brass was big in the late 70s, early 80s. 
and check out how beautifully aged our speed knobs are. These are my favorite knobs of all time, as far as standard ones go, 70s and 80s speed knobs that have aged. Second only to the 1983 prehistoric style knobs, because those are pretty cool too. But we've just got a regular three-way toggle switch here. We'll just take a second to capture the very nice wood grain on this two-piece maple top, as we were talking about earlier. You can see our pick guard has left a little bit of a ding here in our top. It's right there, but that's all right. I'm going to leave our pick guard on, but we took it off to clean it up here. But this right here breaks my heart. You see this weird residue that's on it? That means somebody left the plastic on this pick guard for an extended period of time. You know, that brand new one. And then somebody decided to remove it after it's already done its damage. Like if you are lucky enough to have a guitar that has the plastic on it, please leave it on there. Because nine times out of 10, you're not gonna be happy with the end result anyways. That does it for the body. Let's go ahead and move over to the neck. So we've got a straight up ebony fretboard with inlays that were borrowed from a banjo, which I just happened to have one of the banjo necks right here. Man, I love collecting for this museum because when, whenever I try to reference things, normally I like to show photos, but it's even better just to have it side by side. So it looks like they borrowed this one and just slightly modified it over there. Our 12th fret inlay was taken from over here, except for they took away the little dot underneath it to make it a little easier and they also took a few artistic liberties or maybe they came from a different model but the headstock is definitely almost one for one besides maybe moving the hearts and diamonds a little bit closer together but they did a pretty fancy job here as well as matching the gibson logo in a roundabout way but i honestly never really looked at these inlays super closely before the hearts aren't very well crafted in my opinion they look more like peaches or butts or something i don't know they, they just don't have that rounded curve of coming together. And I looked at my other artisan and it's pretty much the same way, but very cool nonetheless. You've got the ebony fretboard and these frets polished up very nicely. But we have a nut width of 1.71 inches and that increases to 2.06 by the 12th. We've got a first fret neck depth of 0.82 and at the 12th, 0.99. They're very slender 60s style necks. Here's that neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret, just a rounded C. It's actually a little bit flatter in the first fret area but rounds up pretty nicely. Not huge by any means, but they do have a nice roundedness to them. And our headstock here again. Don't forget, flip out winding tuners. Awesome. Just in case you don't understand, that, that's so you can do string changes very quickly if you don't have a string winder on you. If you have one of these Power Peg Pros, you, you, you never need it, but they sure do look cool. I mean, you could just leave them hanging out if you want. I always thought they looked like ninja stars throwing them around. And we can see our perfect truss rod here with our maple neck and the signature of the guy who did the frets. I've always loved the artisan truss rod cover. Maybe it's the font, the way it's engraved. I'm kind of surprised that they didn't go the route of putting a brass truss rod cover on these, as well as a brass nut as was popular. But nope, they left them like this. Now we move on to the backside. So the condition of this guitar reminds me of a owner that keeps it at home, lightly plays it, always takes good care of it, and then he lends it to his buddy for one night and then he dings it all up and returns it like nothing's wrong. And then they never speak again for another 30 years. Because you just have this line of divots right here. It's not like your usual circle coil cables. I mean, there was something on his jeans one day that just dinged it up. There's like a small impression line right there. Then you have a couple of marks here, but overall, this was very well preserved. It was strange. There was something green on the finish and it was really hard to get off. But after about an hour of scrubbing, I finally got it all off. It was all built up here along the edges. There's like sticker residue here, probably from a shop store sticker. But since it was already removed, I don't need the residue on it, but at the end of the day, it's beautiful again. Speaking of beautiful, look at our untouched electronics. So I'm gonna go ahead and say it, this does not have weight relief. This is probably one of the older bodies that they just had laying around because it's before they switched to the CNC routing. You can tell by the circle channel route right there. Then we can see our pots right here, which all date the way I would expect. Looks like 81s for here, 82s there. And it does still have the shielding tray here with a factory ground wire. As far as the edges go, artisans do indeed have the thick binding in the cutaway. Pretty much the only special thing here are the diamond posi lock strap locks. Such a cool little feature. They're just designed to help keep your strap on. Kind of like a strap lock. That's what these teeth are for.
check out this knack. Artisans do not typically have flamed knacks. They're just three pieces of plain maple, usually. Now that doesn't mean you don't find some that have some light figuring, but such even figuring throughout three pieces, you know this one was definitely the pride and joy of a Kalamazoo worker when they were making it and specking it out. As our serial number here tells us it is the second guitar produced on the 158th day of 1982. Kalamazoo made because this is $4.99 or less and we have the vertical stamp. Then you can see the backside of our Gibson tuners and again, no volute on this one. Not even a small one. And in terms of Gibson things, having a maple neck with no volute is the rarest option because it really only happened for like maybe six to eight months, if that. So that's just kind of cool that all these nice specs are on this particular Les Paul Artisan because I just love collecting the has all the cool model Les Paul customs. And now I've got an Artisan, which I, I didn't even know it exactly existed. However, you might ask the question, if I'm so confident that this is a custom special order, why does it not have a custom shop original decal on it or a custom shop edition? Well, first off, 1982 is when they first started it. And I think this one's a little bit too early for that. But just because something was custom ordered does not necessarily mean it got that. It's just a good indication of if you do have that, it does mean that. Because sometimes you just find random things where you can find the original owner that says, hey, yeah, I custom ordered this, but was it really a custom order or was it, hey, this shop doesn't normally carry this. We're going to custom order it from Gibson and ship it here. Like for example, my first Gibson Les Paul was a 2012 Gibson Silverburst. I had to custom order it from Guitar Center, but it wasn't truly a custom order. It's just because they didn't carry one in stock. They needed to order it. I wasn't customizing all the specs or anything. So sometimes there can be some confusion in the terms of what a true custom order was. With such beautifully aged lacquer, this is exactly what I was expecting. A nice, very even glow throughout everything, including the knobs. You can see there's maybe a little bit of sweat absorption right here, but not too much. I'm sure the dark finish kind of helps hide that discoloration in normal lighting situations. But everything's looking good on our neck and the face of the headstock. I don't even see any hanger rash on the front. Flip it over to the back, you're looking good. You can see some of those dings I was talking about. I mean, you could technically refinish the back and probably get rid of all these dings because they're not super deep by any means, but then if somebody blacklights so it, they're gonna be very confused why the back does not glow. I remember I ran across, I think a white custom that had that done one point in time and I was like, what's going on here? I think that was before I did like big video documentation processes though. So don't go looking for that video anywhere but our sides are looking great. And here's a good example of, you can take the sticker off the guitar, but you can't take the sticker's history off of the finish. Under blacklight, it still will show up. You have that little box area. Now normally store ID stickers, I'll, I'll keep on if it looks like it was the original store, but I think that was just like a used inventory sticker. Cause normally the big store stickers will be like, right here, sometimes they cover the Made in USA, or they have it right there. Those ones you definitely should keep on. But I would say this one passes with flying colors. It is a fantastic example. Okay, maybe we do have a little bit of rubbing right here from a stand, and a little bit more so right here. But not too bad for being from 1982. All said and done, the moment of truth is at 12 pounds. Pretty darn close to it. 11 pounds, five ounces. <laughs> It's way too heavy for what it is, but it is beautiful. So let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how these sound.
gotta say, really digging the clean tones out of this one tonight. That neck pickup is so juicy. <laughs> even. Bridge has the bite. But the true magic with these it definitely has to be the middle position. thought that gave really good dire straight sounds. <laughs> That'll be know all about this rare 1982 Gibson Les Paul Artisan. What are my final thoughts on this thing? The three pickups are really in your way when you play, but the tones are quite interesting. I really love the cleans out of this one. Now, as far as distortion goes, I've never really been a big fan of the Tarback pickups, whether that's the Series 7s or any other of the Tarback variations. I've always just preferred these standard T-Tops and Tim Shaw's, and it's probably just because that's what the famous people ended up using to record all those famous songs that you've heard these pickups in. But I am just enamored with this example. I've actually had a few people try to buy this off of me before I even like featured it just off of the guitar hunting episode. But now that I have this thing in my hands, yeah, I'm not gonna let this one go. It's just too darn clean, and it's got so many cool features that you don't normally see on an artisan. This will definitely be in display on my future museum. In fact, I would like to have one of every color artisan, one from every year. I think that would just be fun, but to find it, that'll all line up. Like this is a three pickup walnut one. So I'll have to find all the other colors and hope it just matches up for the days. <laughs> But if anybody has a white Les Paul Artisan, the famous 1982 run, please let me know. I would definitely like to own one of those. It is a golden goose, I guess you could say. I've been hunting for that for a couple of years now. All right, Chocolateites, I hope you enjoyed our annual Les Paul Artisan review. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.